It's high time they understood. Nobody attacks Endrin. Nobody. Werewolf the Apocalypse Earthblood is a 2021 video game that just isn't very good. And most discussion of the game ends there, with maybe a few added references to the tabletop versions of the game mixed in. And if you're looking for me to challenge that narrative, well, I'm, I'm not really going to. All the reviews are completely correct about this game, and for all of the reasons that they cite. Shoddy graphics, boring and tonally dissonant gameplay, and a really lackluster narrative. But even so, this game is not a standalone piece of work, and because of that, there's still plenty to discuss in terms of what this game is, what its existence says about Paradox Interactive's approach to the World of Darkness franchise, and also the story of how this game came to be after two decades of cancelled Werewolf the Apocalypse video games. So let's start with that. How did we get here? What is Werewolf the Apocalypse? Welcome back to my three-part series on the World of Darkness video games. Last week, we discussed Vampire the Masquerade Redemption, and we also covered the broad strokes of what the Vampire the Masquerade tabletop system was, and the intricacies of what vampire society entails in that game. But one thing you'll notice if you look too hard at Vampire the Masquerade is just how urban it is. Most vampires stick to the cities, and this isn't just because that's where their prey is. There's another reason, too. Another reason that the kindred prefer boats and air travel to highways and backroads. It's because of the teeth and the claws that guard those places. It's because of the werewolves. This is how the World of Darkness functions. The game lines are parallel, but disconnected. To a player of Vampire the Masquerade, the werewolves are merely a wilderness threat, a reason to not wander outside of city limits. But to the werewolves who call themselves the Garu, the vampires are in fact nothing more than the least important of all their worm-tainted enemies. The werewolves aren't cursed humans the way that vampires are. They are an entirely separate species created by Gaia herself to protect nature from the impending apocalypse. They are the gnashing teeth and rending claws of Mother Nature, our planet's first and last defense against the apocalypse. All of this would be completely lost if you only saw the world of darkness from the vampiric point of view. They don't know I'm a warrior of Gaia. But the great tragedy of the setting, and of the werewolves themselves, is that it's the personal failings of the Garu that cause the world to freefall towards the end times in the first place. The Garu have always been imperfect guardians. The world of darkness isn't survival horror, it's personal horror. And every game approaches this theme from a different angle. Werewolf's Core is about those times when all of the calamitous and ruinous problems surrounding you are entirely your fault, but you're also the only one who can fix them. And unfortunately, in order to fix those problems, you just have to be a less shitty person than you currently are. While this does certainly ring true to life, there's also an element to this narrative that has always made Werewolf stand out next to the other lines in the World of Darkness. Werewolf is probably the only line that leans away from the goth punk stylings of the rest of the World of Darkness and leans into being full-on grimdark. While this does help give Werewolf the Apocalypse its own distinct personality compared to the other White Wolf games, it does have the amusing tendency to make the more personal nature of the other game lines feel just painfully self-absorbed. And I'm just adding some drips on the corner of my mouth where it would naturally be if I was biting someone's neck. Warriors of Gaia, do not be fooled by the beauty of the canite filth. Their existence is a symptom of the great destroyer. These are servants of the worm. Instead of hexing someone, use this spell to get them to leave you alone. None of this is helpful, warriors of Gaia. You can only rely on tooth and claw. She was a fairy. I can't make this any clearer. The planet is dying! This setting was released in 1992, the second World of Darkness title, and it has for the last three decades been iterated upon repeatedly. In my last video, we discussed the World of Darkness in its 90s context. 
but we're now studying the setting through a 2021 video game. So this becomes a good opportunity to explore what's happened in all the years since the 90s. It's been 20 years since the World of Darkness was a cultural touchstone, since Vampire the Masquerade was the second best-selling TTRPG, only surpassed by Dungeons & Dragons. What the hell happened to it? There's a number of things that caused this decline. Let's start with the release of Werewolf the Apocalypse. After the hit that was Vampire the Masquerade, Werewolf was released to add another supernatural POV to the setting. The next year, they released Mage the Ascension. These three came together to be thought of as the core trio of the World of Darkness. Vampire was a hit, Werewolf was almost as popular, and Mage, while still lagging behind the other two, was still well-liked and widely played. But then, well, then they kept going. Wraith the Oblivion, Changeling the Dreaming, Mummy the Resurrected, and none of these were even close to the big three. And to be clear, I would never call a single one of these games a mistake to have put out. Not even a financial mistake. Many World of Darkness fans often purchase the new core book releases more just as a book of fiction than anything else, whether or not they were intending on actually playing them. The problem was that they kept over-investing into these less popular game lines, trying to give them equivalence to all the books they were producing for their hit lines. I mentioned last time how Vampire the Masquerade spun off into a Dark Age setting, and eventually into a Victorian era setting as well. This seemed to be a positive sign that the more popular lines were getting extra attention from White Wolf in order to pay the bills and allow the niche systems to get fun limited runs. Instead, White Wolf doubled down in a very different way providing Dark Age books for all of their other game lines too, and then tripling down and creating more historical spin-offs for their other game lines. Werewolf, the Wild West, Mage, the Sorcerer's Crusade, Wraith, the Great War. Vampire Dark Ages sold well. These other ones, they did not. Somehow the lasting memory of what went wrong here has gotten completely skewed. Many of the designers from that age still claim that the declining sales were because of the meta plot that accompanied these games. See, the meta plot was this detail where the world of darkness was contemporary to the real world, and every year things would happen and the setting would advance in real time. If you wanted to keep up with how the world of darkness was progressing alongside our own, you'd need to keep up with the new releases. Eventually, after years of this, the canon of 90s world of darkness was so convoluted and hostile to new players that they ended up just needing to do a series of end time events to finish the world of darkness, and then they re booted the canon in a series of sequels with a fresh new setting that would come to be called the Chronicles of Darkness, beginning with Vampire the Requiem in 2004. Many claim meta plot fatigue for the system's decline, and that certainly was a big factor, but I just don't personally see how that could possibly have been the biggest problem in the face of small gameline overinvestment to the tune of 35 changeling books over a 10 year period. Like I said, these niche game lines were not a mistake. I would never call them that, but they were clearly overcommitted to. Whatever the truth, all of these factors ended up combining with a general TTRPG industry decline around the year 2000. It meant that the 90s publishing strategy wasn't going to be able to carry forward into the new millennium. While White Wolf didn't appear to be in any true financial trouble yet, it was clear that it would likely happen soon. Several years earlier, TSR, the company who published D&D, had gone bankrupt and had to be bought out by Wizards of the Coast in order to stay alive. Not wanting to be the next TTRPG company to go defunct, White Wolf chose to double down on a recent strength. The video games they had been experimenting with after Vampire Redemption in 2000 had been doing quite well. And while Bloodlines in 2004 was initially a financial failure, it was still a proof of concept for just how much promise this setting had as a video game franchise. Not to mention their Hunter the Reckoning trilogy was well loved. Quite pertinent to this video, during this time period there were no less than three cancelled Werewolf the Apocalypse games. One by Capcom, another by Dreamforge that was quite far along actually before it lost its publisher, and another by Troika Games that was intended to be the sequel to Vampire Bloodlines. So why did the World of Darkness slash Chronicles of Darkness decline? Well, the World of Darkness video games showed a ton of promise, possibly as the future of the entire IP. But a 
print-based pen and paper publisher like White Wolf wasn't actually in a position to support these games as they needed. If they wanted games like Bloodlines to have the resources they needed to thrive, and Werewolf to finally have the backing to get a project finished, then White Wolf was going to need to get more directly involved with video games. Rather than start from scratch, White Wolf made the fatal decision to merge with an Icelandic video game company, CCP. Uh, these are the EVE Online guys, not the, not, not the China guys. Now, when you think mid-2000s video games and the phrase, world of, uh, well, then the next word you likely imagine isn't darkness, it's Warcraft. And that's where CCP's head was at, too. The tabletop got sidelined and reduced to a slow trickle of content in favor of putting all the White Wolf eggs into the MMO basket. But wait, you may be saying, a World of Darkness MMO? I mean, that could actually be good. You may already be putting Josh Strife Hayes World of Darkness review into your search bar. Well, I'm afraid the handsome British man can't help you today, because the MMO never actually released. Development stretched between 2006 to 2014, and in addition to the tabletop getting sidelined, no additional video games were actually produced at all during this time. World of Darkness was a de facto dead IP for nearly a decade. A report from The Guardian dug into the internals of why this project fell through. The biggest factor that put the World of Darkness MMO into development hell seems to have just been the fact that CCP kept on poaching White Wolf staff to work on EVE Online content. This led to repeated cycles of the project being semi-abandoned while all the programmers were gone, followed by the project being reignited and being almost entirely reimagined once the staff had been returned. They'd do a bunch of planning, get back to work, just in time for CCP to steal the programmers away yet again for more EVE Online content. There was plenty of marketing being done, but almost no serious development. By the time the project was abandoned, World of Darkness had lost its place as a major IP. Under CCP, it had gone from one of the most recognized tabletop role-playing games in the world with a burgeoning presence in the video games industry to... I mean, some old game that grognards were always whining about, but I mean, hey, do you remember that old Bloodlines game? That was neat. It was a tragic fate, and deeply frustrating to fans of the series. White Wolf was purchased the following year by Paradox Interactive, a Swedish video game company who's best known for their grand strategy titles like Stellaris, Europa Universalis, and Hearts of Iron. But they also have a wide publishing net, even producing the often overlooked CRPG Tyranny. Paradox is a video game company first and foremost, but they've moved forward with the intent, at least, of not repeating CCP's mistakes. Whether they've succeeded at that is kind of a matter of debate. Work began immediately on bringing a renewed version of the tabletop back, producing a new edition of Vampire the Masquerade in 2018, and beginning to roll out a wave of small video game projects. Paradox has been very clear that they believe Bloodlines to be the crown jewel of the IP, so work began on that immediately. We are right here and now in the midst of the World of Darkness's great return. Hunter the Reckoning 5e came out in 2022, and a new Werewolf the Apocalypse edition just came out like three months ago at time of recording. The content mills have been releasing an ever-rolling line of low-investment small projects set in the World of Darkness over the last four years, including a Werewolf the Apocalypse visual novel, which is actually quite good and I'd really recommend it. And finally, after 25 years of failing to produce one, they finally managed to bring a full Werewolf the Apocalypse game to completion. Now let's be clear, the fate of this new attempt at the World of Darkness is still up in the air. Bloodlines 2 is the crown jewel, and whether or not Paradox's multimedia content strategy pays off, kind of depends on how well it does. If Bloodlines does do well, Paradox funding shall flood into the IP and drown us in spin-offs and content with more generous budgets behind them. If it bombs, though, well, if it bombs, I reckon they just sell White Wolf yet again to a new company. And if you've been watching Bloodlines 2 development, well, uh, I'm nervous, to say the least. <laughs> but here on this side of Bloodlines, we've got a werewolf game to discuss. A little project called Earthblood. 
But before we dive fully into that... Are you winning, Warrior of Gaia? If you're enjoying this video, it would really help take the war to the corporations if you would like it and consider subscribing to the channel. I cover all sorts of video games that are related to tabletop franchises. Most typically this is Dungeons & Dragons, but sometimes we pop our head into Warhammer as well, and now that the floodgates have opened, World of Darkness, it's in the rotation too now. In regards to that last vampire video, just wanted to give everyone a big thank you. All your likes and comments really help that thing get started in the algorithm, so it is now safe for this channel to regularly cover World of Darkness. You guys rule. And if you'd like to further support the channel, please think about signing up on Patreon. I've got plenty of bonus perks like early video access, previews to what I'm working on, printable game assets, to a 900 year old role playing game that the Normans used to play, and an exclusive podcast where I bring on guests to chat about all the behind the scene details on my videos or the games I'm covering. This last month I brought on my colleague Unimportant Hero who was deeply involved in the World of Darkness community back in the 90s, and we discuss all the fine details including how CCP declared war on the fan communities in the mid 2000s. Signing up on Patreon is the best way to support this channel and to help make these videos possible. We're starting to push into a milestone at the moment, and if we can get up to 300 Canadian a month, I'm going to be able to afford all of the setup required to start experimenting with live streaming these games for all of you as I playtest them. So if you want to join me live on my journey of testing out all the video games of tabletop franchises, this is the best way to do it. Now, Werewolf the Apocalypse Earthblood begins with the most important piece of lore about the werewolf setting, so let's talk about that. The problem with World of Darkness cosmology is that it's incredibly contradictory, and it's supposed to be that way. Even different werewolf clans disagree on the werewolf creation myth, but sticking to the broad strokes, the gist of it is this. The wild which produces raw, chaotic matter. The weaver who spins this chaos into an ordered fabric, and the worm who destroys to make room for the new. At some point, the weaver went mad, furious at the worm for destroying everything it would spin. It imprisoned the worm so that it could happily fill the universe with its orderly creations. The worm lost its mind in captivity, and when it broke free of its cage, it became the primeval of the entire universe, intent on destroying all until nothing remains. Gaia, our planet, needed to protect herself from the worm's destructive influence. She created the Garu and other types of shifters to be her warriors. Recognizing the potential of the primitive humans, the Garu were meant to guide humanity and to police it where needed. To allow them to do this, Gaia gifted them with the power of rage, which is a mighty boon indeed. In the world of darkness, all but the most powerful vampires are no match for even the weakest of werewolves. But there is, as I'm sure you can already see, a downside to creating a cast of eternal guardians whose primary tool is anger. The werewolves' greatest downfall has always been their interpersonal problems. When humanity began inventing agriculture and settling into cities, the werewolves kind of lost their damn minds over it. Now keep in mind that the exact order of the following events that they did in response is disputed by various sources, so I'm not going to try and construct any chain of one thing leading to another. There's no definitive answers on when this stuff happened or in what order. Fearing that the city-states were servants of the Weaver, the Garu implemented a policy known as the Impergium. If they couldn't control humanity any longer, they would simply have to keep human numbers small, regularly slaughtering humans when they got too numerous. This population control policy lasted for thousands of years, leaving humanity with a sort of evolutionary trauma called the Delirium. The delirium is why humans cluster together so tightly, why they fear the dark and the wilds. Indeed, the human mind can't even comprehend the Garu, and upon seeing a werewolf, the traumatized brain will simply forget what it saw if it survives the encounter. Perhaps owing to the debates surrounding the Impergium, or perhaps not, the packs grew distant from one another, distrustful of all but themselves. 
Eventually, this came to a head and escalated into a great war of rage that was truly the turning point where the Garu started to seriously fail at their mission of guiding humanity. The Garu believed that they were Gaia's chosen, and all the other shifters would need to serve them or be eliminated. The war reduced the shifters on all sides to a fraction of their original numbers, but the Garu ultimately came out far more numerous than any of the others. To make matters worse, no longer having the help of the other shifters, the Garu quickly turned on one another, the packs becoming cold and territorial. Every last clan was isolated and working alone against the world. Evil's grip upon humanity grew as its population boomed. The Weaver's cities rose to the skies, and the Worm's factories strangled the very air. The turning point where this turned so much worse was when an oil company named Pentex swore their devotion to the Worm and began intentionally steering the planet towards the apocalypse. The full industrial might of capitalism was behind them as they produced products that corrupted consumers and could even transform them into Fomori. The end times are coming. The machines of industry choke and drill through the wild, and the werewolves just can't stop it. Not without becoming better people than they are. This is where our game starts, after the opening cutscene. Just outside of a factory owned by Endron, a Pentec subsidiary. We are Kahal, a werewolf, and more importantly, a father. Listen, Kahal had limited options in life. I mean, look at him. It was werewolf dad, knife sharpener, or lighthouse keeper. Our pack is preparing to raid the Endron facility. But Kahal is basically the pack's heavy, which means for us, uh, we're just supposed to stand around camp and kick dirt until something goes wrong. Which obviously doesn't sit well with Kahal, considering that the infiltrator who's going into the facility is his wife, Ludmilla. Now, breeding for werewolves is a whole thing. If they try and have children together, their werewolf blood will breathe too hot in the child, and it ends up being kind of a Habsburg situation. Instead, they need to breed with either a human human or a wolf. Kahal's wife uh, is fortunately a, a human. She's in fact the sister of our pack leader, but she didn't inherit the Garu powers. Now, critique number one of this game, and of the lore, is the fact that the devs seem to have just completely forgotten about the delirium. Sometimes the non-Garu children of werewolves will come out with minor powers, which could explain why Ludmilla is capable of hanging out with werewolves and not having the delirium cause all the memories to just slide out of her brain. But our pack also has a wing of fully human activists led by a hacker named Ava, and not a single one of them has any difficulty with the whole werewolf thing. The mission goes south, as, I mean, of course it does, and Kahal rushes headlong into Endron, ripping and tearing through the security forces. Unfortunately, Ludmilla is captured by a black spiral dancer, which is a pack of werewolves that have made a pact with the worm. Ludmilla is slain, and Kahal flies into a rage, slaying one of his pack mates. Rodko, the pack leader, snaps us out of it, but Kahal's anger runs too deep, and he exiles himself from the pack and his daughter, not wanting to tear them physically or mentally apart with his rage. Now, uh, we're not all that far into the game, but we already need to take a hard stop to discuss something that's a bit of an elephant in the room. This game's presentational quality is kind of all over the place, isn't it? The environment looks decent, and Kahal, alongside his various forms, are well-crafted models, and every other character looks like they were bought for cheap off the Unity Asset Store. This extends to the voice acting, too. It's not just the visuals that have this roller coaster of quality. Well, fuck you two. This game clearly didn't have a lot to work with, and I gotta give it some compliments for the stuff that they did do well, but goddamn, is everything else just beyond bad? I reckon it's one of two things that went wrong here. Possibly both at the same time, even. The first is that the budget was likely not big enough to have made a game like this. Since we're here on this side of Bloodlines 2, all of the games are on the kind of low budget and therefore low risk, but also low reward school of thought. This is not the most well-liked or popular video game in the world, but I actually wouldn't be surprised if it was still a financial success. Does not look like it cost very much to make. 
The other thing that possibly went wrong is that I suspect there were probably some hasty rewrites. The game actually got delayed for six months at one point, and I have literally zero proof of this, but I feel like during that time, a lot of this game was cut out, censored, and hastily rewritten. But when it comes to the overall quality of things, the one place that completely shines is the music. Now, when you think about Werewolf the Apocalypse, I think our brains all simultaneously go to hard rock and metal. And that's exactly what we got. With some nice kind of tribal elements mixed in, it's good. Cahal spends five years away from his family and his pack, working as a mercenary. He takes a job stealing weapons from Endrin, and soon stumbles across a note stating that the corporation's private army is about to attack the cairn where Cahal's pack resides. We return in time to save a wounded Rodko, scaring off Endrin's vicious commander, Tank Girl. With Rodko out of action and many of the Garu dead, it's up to Kahal to take down the corporate facilities that have sprung up surrounding the once secluded wildlife enclave. The local spirit pleads with us to tear out the worm's influence and to restore the wild. As Gaia weakened, so too do I. We reconnect with our daughter, Edana who is understandably angry that her dad abandoned her after Cahal's wife died. She's Garu too, but she prefers to take after her mother as an infiltrator, and hasn't even experienced her first change yet. Ava and her activists have taught her their ways, and Cahal is clearly terrified of this path, considering what happened to Ludmilla. As the group of us continue to infiltrate Endron territory, we learn a bit more about them. Apparently, they're running a big media campaign surrounding their new biofuel that's guaranteed 100% clean. No carbon, no nothing. Behind the scenes, though, we hear what the corporation really thinks. Whether or not this biofuel is all it cracks up to be, not a single human being working for Endron gives a crap about harming the environment. In fact, many of the suits are knowingly working for the worm. So, with this explicit reference to evil companies greenwashing themselves, we've dug down and hit a rich deposit of themes. It's just a shame that Earthblood is too frightened to do anything with them. Eco tourism is what I'm going to call the particular phrase that I absolutely cannot say on this platform. This game starts off well. I was prepared to forgive the lack of polish for the fact that this game seemed to want to sincerely give us an exploration of the concept of ecotourism. Cahal is an ecotourist. This is explicit. They even say it straight up in much of the early advertising and interviews about this game. Now, exploring this concept is absolutely in line with the original role-playing game. It's also very respectable, I must say, how well gameplay mechanics line up with the current discussion surrounding ecotourism. Probably the most prominent book on this subject right now is this thing, which I can't say out loud because, oh boy! Anyway, it asks a question that we usually don't think about very often. Where the hell are all the ecotourists? Like, think about it. Climate catastrophe is looming on the horizon, and many of the effects are already being felt. You know, I had to cancel five separate medical appointments this summer because the road was on fire for four months! It's an issue that literally millions of people care very deeply about, and it's an issue that governments and corporations have mostly decided to not care about, outside of tiny changes and greenwashing. Peaceful protest has done very little to prompt action, and you probably know the saying about what happens when you make peaceful change impossible. Not only that, but the stakes are catastrophically high. Hundreds of millions of people stand to be put at risk if climate change isn't drastically addressed in the near future. So like I said, the question of the book is simply, where the hell are all the ecotourists? It's kind of surprising how few there are compared to the drasticness of the cause and the foot-dragging of those in power. And by the way, there's levels of these things too. It doesn't go straight to being a werewolf and attacking corporations. There's a ton of steps along this road that are a lot closer to vandalism as a form of protest than anything, like, actually violent. 
The book cites an example that as few as a hundred determined activists keying cars at night could render large cities to be completely uninhabitable to the most environmentally reckless gas-guzzling vehicles. And yet, even such a small act as that hasn't happened. The suffragettes famously smashed windows in London repeatedly as a form of protest against the government's brutality against strikers. And in the end, this diversity of tactics ended up working out great for them. Where are all the ecotourists is the Fermi paradox of climate change. And look, I'm a guy who reviews video games. I don't have answers to any of this. And to be clear, I'm not also advocating for anything right now, one side or the other. This is all strictly relevant to Earthblood, because this game positioned itself through the marketing and the early scenes as though it wanted to explore this topic. It clickbaits you. And we're super happy to come back with the main question of Werewolf the Apocalypse, which is when will you rage? When have you had enough? When do you just want to change into a three meter tall crinos and rip the head off, insert name of hate politician or terrorist leader here? I mean, in the 90s, very few people knew about sort of global warming and environmental devastation, and it was a fringe thing. And this game took a very fringe position. Today, it's something that everybody knows about, and it's very, very commonly established scientific fact. So today, I think the werewolves look at us and say, they all know, and they do nothing. And I think the fans are excited to ask the question to everybody now and just go, when will you rage to the whole world? Because yeah, if, if, if not now, when? <laughs> and yet, although they set all of this up and developers in interviews stated that they wanted to explore if there was a cost to solving the climate crisis with violence, those themes never actually pay off. This game doesn't make any effort to explore these ideas. They're just set dressing. They're just kind of there. There isn't an exploration, or a discussion, or even very much understanding about the subject. These difficult, complex topics are brought up to impress you, like a teenager at a party dropping Nietzsche quotes. There's no debate within the game, no big choices or branching paths to weigh the pros and cons of ecotourism, no exploration of consequences or of results. My conspiracy is that someone high up got scared of if the game was going to cause a controversy, and then the team had to hastily alter damn near everything. That could be why all the NPCs look and sound like crap. They may have just been stitched in last minute to de-emphasize the ecotourism part of the story. And if that is what happened, I'm mad on behalf of the devs, because so many things are perfectly crafted to tell a story about this, and their game just got, like, yassified in some corporate boardroom. But this game is just absolutely inexcusable compared to its peer. The werewolf visual novel actually does explore this topic of peaceful versus violent actions against climate destruction. I'll simply say that Werewolf Heart of the Forest did it better. World of Darkness is messy, and not always well made, but it's also entirely sincere and brave enough to talk about controversy. Werewolf could have been that. We could have had a messy game with big important ideas in it. But instead, we got a poorly made game that's utterly terrified to say anything about the ideas that it brought up. A werewolf game that manages to be utterly toothless. So, okay, if Earthblood isn't about all of the themes that it tells us it's about, what the hell is it about? Well, as we continue to attack Endron, we learn that their biofuel is known internally as Earthblood, and that Endron is somehow using it to beef up their soldiers. Not long after learning this, Cahal's worst nightmare comes true. Adana is taken by Endron CEO Richard Wadkins. Furious at letting down his niece as he did his sister, Rodko loses himself completely to his rage forcing Cahal to put him down. We track Adana to a private prison that Endrin is running, and Cahal manages to get himself locked up there. And while we're too late to save Adana, we do find the leader of a Nevada pack of werewolves there, an elder named Onawa. We learn from Onawa and terminals spread across the rest of the facility that Endrin is experimenting on Garu, and is especially interested in Adana due to the fact that she has not yet undergone her first change. Nevada was where Endrin was developing their biofuel, and where the company HQ is. So we head there with Onawa to see if we can get our daughter back and shut down the Earthblood program. Whatever the hell that is. Where the spirit of the Garu back in Kahal's cairn was all about fighting back, Onawa's clan, plus her spirit, are mostly just happy to stay put and survive, even taunting us at the very idea of fighting back. 
Hoping to prove ourselves to them, Cahal clears the forward base around Endron HQ, occupying it with Ava's team of activists. We rage across the office building, soon catching up to Wadkins and Adana. You must be Cahal. It's time for you to pay for what you've done to this company. Your daughter's hate and fears will make a perfect host for Banes. And as for your friends... Well, I've got a score to settle with them too. It's high time they understood. Nobody attacks Endrin. Nobody. Launch Earthblood. No! I'm gonna kill you, you motherfucker! You're gonna pay! A red talon, one of Onawa's pack, attacks us. Meanwhile, Wadkins demonstrates what Earthblood truly is. This Earthblood biofuel won't pollute the environment as it's burned in people's cars, but it will pollute people's souls, binding them with the evil spirits who serve the worm and transforming them into monstrous Fomori. After putting down his allies, Kahal moves to confront Onawa and the great spirit of her cairn. It is a genuinely fun boss fight, taking down waves of wolves and smacking down Onawa until the spirit is forced to intervene. The combat in this game is decently fun, but it's very simple, honestly feeling more like a minigame than a core mechanic. The actual core of this game is very... I mean, it's very Ubisoft. First and foremost, Werewolf Earthblood is a stealth game that feels kind of like a low-effort, if vaguely competent, Ubisoft clone. Combat is usually avoidable as you can stealth clear entire rooms or just sneak past them. And even if you do intend on smashing up a room full of enemies the old-fashioned way, it's often beneficial to do some stealth work first to sabotage all the enemy reinforcement points. The stealth is reasonably well-baked, with most of Cyanide Studios' dev team coming from the latest Styx game. It means that the stealth is well-crafted, but also kind of overrepresented. Still, I can't deny that the constant swapping between wolf and human forms for stealth are a highlight. The forms for that matter are well implemented and specialized. Human is for computers, doors, and stealth kills. Wolf is for sneaking, moving quickly, and tight spaces. And your werewolf form is for leveling the entire city block. Still, something is notably missing here. In the tabletop version of this game, you have access to five forms. The two that are missing are the mostly human form and the mostly wolf form. Being that neither of these are actually implemented, I suspect that the version of Earthblood that we got was a result of a lot of cut corners. When you're making a creative project, you will often find that the final result of what you're making isn't immediately clear when you start the project. Projects find themselves as time goes on. Mechanics will become more obvious to the developers as the game gets more and more complete. In order to make a truly good game, you need to not only have talented people with vision, but you also need to budget enough time to make revisions. Because on day one of development, when you're doing all the planning, that's when you know the least about your game. Many of the best video games of all time are the ones that have allowed themselves the space or the time to change themselves as the developers discover what they're making. Paradox. The publisher of this game, though not the developer of it, is kind of famous for doing this in a bit of a backwards way. Instead of allowing plenty of time for revisions, they constantly reinvent their games over a few years post-release. Longtime players of Stellaris will likely remember how barren and janky the first release was, followed by just this huge explosion of experimentation, discovery, and reinvention over the years until we got to the current winning formula that basically just shuts down all competing 4X space games. Banging on a trash can. Banging just as loud as you can. 
Most famously, this extended dev cycle is also how we got the Crusader Kings of today. The first release of Crusader Kings 2 was a classic grand strategy game with the added twist that every kingdom was a giant web of vassals that you had to deal with in order to accomplish your goals. You also didn't have to play as the ruler, you could play as those vassals and build up your domain in an attempt to seize the throne. As development continued post-launch, the devs at some point made a peculiar realization. They hadn't made a strategy game. I mean, they did, but that was actually the B-plot. The incidental star of Crusader Kings 2, the great appeal of it, was that Paradox had accidentally made one of the greatest medieval life sims ever. Development shifted towards adding character and story-focused content, and almost turning it into an RPG to some degree. And the game's popularity skyrocketed. And none of this would have been possible if the devs hadn't read the room of their own creation. And whatever you think of Paradox's backward strategy of discovering their games post-launch, it's certainly better than not doing it at all. Something I would argue is what made Werewolf Earthblood so bad. We see all the way back in 2019 that they had committed to the idea of this being a werewolf brawler that has extra stealth mechanics thanks to bringing on the Sticks dev team. Are brought to the fore in this game. Uh, it will be an action RPG and it's going to be set on the North American continent. But what probably should have been obvious to the project heads partway through the game is that what they had just designed was in fact the core components of a Werewolf the Apocalypse immersive sim. Werewolf Deus Ex, if you will. There are so many little fragments of this in the game. Moments where Cahal can use his human form to schmooze his way past guards. But it basically comes down to all problems either being solved by werewolf smashing or one very intentionally designed alternate path. Now the fact that the game is constantly telling you to think carefully about when to wolf out it suggests that some of the devs kind of got it, that alternate paths were supposed to be a lot more in-depth than they are. And yet, despite the fact that they had very clearly and very obviously stumbled into a cool formula for a game, the dev team just never seemed to have pivoted off of their original vision. Maybe this was inflexibility, or tight deadlines, or maybe just an unwillingness to actually fund this little project for a proper dev cycle. And so we're just left with this game that feels like an early alpha version of a much better game. When you play this game, there's just, there's just so obviously a hole there. And if you know virtually anything about Werewolf the Apocalypse, it becomes pretty obvious that that hole just happens to be shaped exactly like the Glabro and Hispro forms. A better version of this game. A version that had enough time to recommit to the gameplay loop. A version where you can use Glabro and Hispro forms to open up extra paths. I mean, that actually gets me drooling. Imagine being able to combat with a small number of enemies in your hybrid forms, and have that be your bread and butter in a fight. Then, when times get tough, you always have the option to swap to your Krenos form. But doing that will cause your foes to go absolutely feral with the delirium, fleeing and gathering allies or triggering alarms and locking down the facility, thus making everything else so much harder for you. Now, suddenly every door in the entire place is locked. So now what, Mr. Werewolf? You played yourself. This alternate version of Werewolf delivers on the core theme with so much more nuance. When is it time to get angry about climate change? The elements of the gameplay that launched do just barely reinforce these themes, just enough to ask you to ask yourself the question, but certainly not enough to meaningfully comment on it. The game we got answers the question of when to get mad by shrugging and just going, eh, whenever you want, I guess, stealth's optional. A better version of this game that plays like Werewolf Deus Ex might lead you to many different answers to that question depending on your playstyle. The answer might be, eh, whenever I can get away with it, or there's always another way, or right now do you not see what we're up against? This flawed version of the gameplay that we have kind of just brings up the themes but a more complex and nuanced version of this game would have actually delivered on those ideas. A version of the game that's like that would have done a lot to make up for the fact that the story is just kind of not paying very much attention to the themes. So we've got this toothless werewolf game that's mostly about stealth mechanics. 
After beating the hell out of Onawa and her spirit friend, we accompany what's left of Ava's team to attack the Endron oil rig where Earthblood is produced. We find Idana, but it's too late. Endron has already completed their abhorrent experiment. Dad, this hurts. I'm burning. No. Ah! So we kill our own daughter. It's supposed to be the emotional climax of the game, but the devs didn't even give Adana a character model of the same console generation as Kahal. So if they don't care about this character, I mean, I guess neither do I. I'll simply say, The Last of Us did it better. There is a final choice, chase Wadkins down or rescue Ava and your allies. I choose to save Ava, cause I mean, there's a million Wadkins out there, but really not that many Avas. Whatever you choose, we end up in a boardroom with a Pentex executive demanding to see Wadkins' research to further the purpose of the worm. It's a game where werewolves smash, except not enough to be fun, because it's mostly a stealth game. How'd this happen? How'd this get made? As stated in the first half of this video, Paradox is going broad with its multimedia policy, which Honestly, I think is the correct approach. I've spoken a number of times about how Games Workshop is doing a remarkable job being so free with its license. It opens the door to allow underdog projects like Mechanicus and Vermintide to get made, all at the cost of the fact that they sometimes put out dud games. That's just the cost of being so experimental and broad-focused. Werewolf Earthblood is, in my opinion, just one of those dud games that you get every now and then with this content policy. It actually could have been really good if the budget was large enough to have made this the proper immersive sim it was meant to be. But even so, I can't waste too much time being mad about this game. There's plenty coming out in the world of darkness right now, even on this side of Bloodlines 2, and most of it is better than this. In fact, this is probably the worst World of Darkness video game. So let's not despair just yet at the future of the IP, or even at the future of werewolf games. Who knows, we may still see Werewolf Deus Ex farther down the road. But that's Werewolf Earthblood. If any of you got interested in Werewolf the Apocalypse through this video, then check out Heart of the Forest. It's much, much better. Or check out the tabletop, it just came out! Next episode, we're gonna go check out the last game in my World of Darkness introduction series, a horror VR game called Wraith Afterlife. It's a good opportunity to talk about the smaller game lines in the World of Darkness, so I hope to see you there. Also, for uh, sponsor contract reasons, it's not gonna be my next video. My next video is gonna be a D&D game, uh, and then we'll do Wraith. I hope to see you there.